resources. So thank you for joining us today. Um, you're here for the Seed Supplies and Setting Up for Success webinar hosted by the 5B Resilience Garden. We've got a little overview of what we'll be sharing today. So you will hear who Mano and I are, what 5B Resilience Gardens is, and then we'll jump into the material and cover seeds, starts, garden tools, soil amendments, record keeping, and then we'll go into our Q&A session. Um, I will just remind everyone at this point, if you could please mute, that way we can um, avoid any of that background noise on the recording. Thank you so much. Um, I'll start off with my introduction and I'll, then I'll hand it over to Mano. So I'm Amy Mateus. I am the program director for the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. I co-manage the Wood River Seed Library along with Mano been gardening here in the Wood River Valley since 2016. Um, I'm also a seed saver, so I have been saving seeds for about four seasons now, and I attended seed school with Snake River Seed Co-op in 2019. Um, i have also a cook and a food preservationist, and I really love preserving the harvest, foraging, um, and growing kind of unique things. I grow a lot of medicinal herbs for my own use as a home herbalist. I am currently enrolled in a permaculture design certificate with an organization called the, um, it's EAT, it's Earth Activist Training. So it's a, it's, it's connecting permaculture as in design of gardens along with social permaculture and social justice. So I'm in that right now. Um, and I work within the broader food system. So I see some of you, I saw yesterday in the webinar we hosted about CSAs. So thanks for being here again today and thank you all. I will now pass it over for, to Mano for her introduction. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Uh, I'm Manon Gaudreau. I'm a master gardener. I've been trained by the University of Idaho, um, well, probably close to 10 years ago now. Um, and I do a home gardening and I took up seed saving the minute I started gardening because things were going to seed. I was not, you know, <laughs> gardening savvy when I started gardening and I saw these things going to seed and I thought, oh, I'm not a good gardener. And then I said, yeah, I can save seeds. So I've been saving seeds and I, I love doing that. I remember my mom saving flower seeds and it, it's just dear to my heart. I, I co-manage the Wood River Seed Library, which resides at the Grange. I'm also the treasurer of the, the upper Big Wood River Grange. Um, I've been cooking all my life, uh, traditional cooking, French cooking, Ayurvedic cooking. Um, I, I love, I cook all my food, my food uh, three times a day. I like to eat warm food. Um, I, I love doing food preservation. I, I like to eat pretty much uh, local food. So I've taken on, you know, preserving the food in, in the fall, especially we have all of the produce that are available. So I, I do fermentation to preserve them. And in the spring, all the herbs come out and uh, springtime, late springtime is a good time to harvest my herbs. And uh, so I mostly dehydrate those and, and, I, and I freeze some. Uh, I, I, I do uh, composting at home and yard ecology, I, I compost everything that I want to recycle. Like if I remove the grass, I compost my grass and I don't buy compost, I make my own and it's like black gold. I know. There's nothing as rich as home compost when, when you put all your love into it. And I've converted my uh, landscape into a xeriscape um, and my gardens and my Xeriscape is irrigated by drip system. All right, thanks for that overview, Mano. So quickly about 5B Resilience Gardens. So in the wake of COVID last year, a group of us, some of us working in nonprofits, others of us just community gardeners, really felt like gardening was gonna grow here in the community. We have new people moving in, people interested in gardening like never before. We really wanted to create a way to connect people around gardening, share resources, support each other, and really grow gardening throughout our community. Um, some of us in the collab have the goal, like at some point, our garden, 
our community will have a garden in every single neighborhood. Um, we really hope that that becomes true. And we know that each and every one of you on the call today is part of our gardening community. Um, but we, as a collaboration, have put together a resource list that you can see at 5bresiliencegardens.org. We've also started a youth engagement component of 5B Resilience Garden that's really taking lead in sprout kits. So some of you may have seen that in emails or we had some great press coverage last week or two weeks ago from Ion Sun Valley and the Idaho Mountain Express. And that's really getting kids and families engaged with gardening and cooking from the food that they can grow themselves. So this has been a wonderful collaboration. You can see some of the organizations that are involved. Mano has obviously been a huge part of this um, so we're really happy to have an opportunity to connect with everybody and grow our gardening community. So we have a couple of gardening principles. Uh, Mano and I are actually going to be co-hosting a webinar series with the Haley Public Library on those three specific gardening principles. But just for a really basic overview, our three principles for resilience gardening are food production, pollinator habitat, and soil care. We include resilience gardening at any level of gardening. It can be a single pot of parsley on your windowsill. You could have a multi-acre you know, garden down in Bellevue Triangle or out um, Indian Creek, like I saw some people on the collar from. Like, it can be any size, any scale. It's just about food production, that pollinator habitat. And that's really about reducing the chemical use and creating a space where pollinators can thrive. And then the soil care piece is about building healthy soil, healthy plants, and also being smart with water and irrigation. So um, resilience gardening can also include native plants. It's not limited to that, but we want to make sure that we're including that grouping of plants as it is so vital for our pollinators. So now we will jump into our topic of discussion today. So we really wanted to expand on questions that have come up for us around like, where do people source seeds? Where do I get starts? What, are, what kind of gardening tools do I really need to be successful? So we put together this slideshow that we'll go over. Um, there's a lot of text on here. We won't cover everything, but like I said, we'll share these slides with you so you have those resources to you. Um, so we'll start with seeds because Mano and I love seeds and that's technically where most gardening starts. Um, so some things to consider. Um, are your trusted sources. So we've talked a lot about trusted sources on past webinars. Obviously the Wood River Seed Library is a wonderful local source for seeds, but a lot of us buy seeds from websites or like Adkinson's has stands and racks of seeds. Usually seeds from gardening centers are trustable, trustworthy and reliable. They might not be bioregionally acclimated. So they might work fine where they were grown. They might not work great here. So that's just something to consider. Um, I did want to put up like a distrusted source because some of you may have known that there was a little fraud of seeds being shipped from unknown locations, most of them in China to people who did not order them last season. And there was a lot of concern of like, what's going on? Is this bioterrorism? Um, it turned out to just be like a scam that they were trying to up their verification level on eBay on, on Amazon. So it wasn't harmful, um, but it could be really confusing for new gardeners to get a pack of seeds that are unlabeled. It could be noxious weeds, we don't know. So really try to avoid those types of sources. Um, I personally, if I'm purchasing seeds, I do buy them from Snake River Seed Co-op. It is the Intermountain West Cooperative of Commercial Growers. They're available online. They're also available at Moth Garden Center. Um, I don't think the one has opened here yet. The one in Twin Falls is open with their seeds for this season. Um, a couple other places that I have purchased seeds from the past, Johnny Seeds and Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. Um, I'd love to have Mano jump in now and maybe talk a little bit about seeds and sourcing quality seeds and the Wood River Seed Library seed options. Um, and if you want to, if you already buy seeds and have some sources that aren't listed, drop them in the chat. We'd love to um, pull that information from you all so we make sure we have all the sources available for people. I, I pretty much use seeds that I saved or uh, seeds that have come through the seed library or Wood River Seed Library. Um, sometimes we get last year and uh, previous year too, the Hunger Coalition sometimes has a surplus of seeds that they're not using and they hand them down to the Wood River Seed Library. And sometimes um, 
our gardeners, local gardeners have seed packets, commercial seed packets that they donate to the uh, seed library because they don't use them. So um, I, I, I will use some of those, but I will always prioritize the seeds that have been grown locally because they're adapted to our climate. You know, if, if a seed was planted here and has produced seeds here, it's because it survived our climate. And if we plant it over and over and over, it, it will get adapted to our climate even more. So we, ha we have very cold nights, uh, a lot of wind, dry, you know, hot and dry summer, but we actually have a, a very good climate for cold season uh, crops. And, um, you know, seeds get adapted. Originally, you know, people got seeds uh, from Siberia and other climates that were similar to ours and started growing them here. And uh, I just, I hardly buy any seeds from other places anymore, except, you know, if I, if I run out, I will buy from uh, other small, especially other small places from the West Coast, or I've ordered from Peaceful Valley in the past and Asia Standard. And Johnny's seed is, is a, has been a good source for me. Uh, Baker Creek, but um, you know, in the last few years, I just use the seeds we have here. We have so many. Yeah, my house is literally covered in seeds right now. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for adding that. And Mano spoke to this a little bit, but we just wanted to call this out specifically about adapted varieties and kind of what to look for if you are buying a seed package um, from the Atkinsons or Natural Grocer sell Shelf or even Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, what you want to look for. Um, so the the two main things to look for are really days to maturity. That's about the length that it takes from seed germination to harvestability. So if you're looking at a plant that's like a tomato plant and it has an 111 days to maturity, the likelihood of you being able to plant that and harvest it is very low. Um, we like to say we have 90 days of a growing season here. As we all know, it can frost any night of the summer. So when you have those really long days to maturity, the likelihood of getting a crop is gonna be lower. Um, so Think about 90 days or less for days to maturity. Obviously, the shorter, the better. You're not really going to find tomatoes that go less than 70 days, I think. Um, but definitely look for the shorter um, amount of days till maturity is going to be one key thing when you're buying seeds that aren't regionally adapted. Um, and then plant hardiness zones is another thing that some seed packets will have on them. Um, we usually consider our area a 4B. I think it can change in some pockets. Some people might be a five, some people might be a four A or a three, maybe if you're up close to Stanley. Um, so think about that when you're purchasing seeds as well, because I think um, most seeds that are plant hardiness six or above just probably won't do well here because they like warmer climates in general. Especially um, warm nights. Yeah, the warm nights is the big thing. And you can do stuff to mediate that. You can add protection, whether it's a greenhouse or a hoop house or hot water bottles, like a water wall. I, I think a lot of people use those for tomatoes. You can buffer it and that's great. Um, it's just risky. And if you are growing for sustenance, like you're growing to really feed yourself to offset your grocery budget, you want to go with less risky seeds. So really pay attention to that. If you're like having fun and experimenting and trying to grow all sorts of things, like go for it, experiment, see what happens and share your experiences with us. Um, but if you're really doing this to feed your family, feed yourself, grow your own food, preserve as much as you can, go with the more reliable bioregionally adapted seeds because they will be much more successful um, in the initial first rounds of gardening. Mano, I'll let you kind of talk about those starting supplies. And I know on the next screen, we have a recipe, but do you want to give us a general overview and then I'll move us to the recipe? Okay, so soil to start your, your seed, if you're starting from seed, which we obviously recommend um, because you can transplant your plant at the right time and it minimizes the, the shock to the roots. 
and uh, so you'll, your plant will do better if you start them from seed. Um, so you can make your own potting mix or you can buy potting soil, obviously, from uh, the garden centers around here. They have different potting mixes. Some potting mixes have, uh, are specialized for flowers and they'll have fertilizers for flowers in them. I like to buy a potting soil that is organic, that says it's not the same as organic food, right? You have to, there's no control on the word organic for potting soil, but if it says it's organic, uh, chances are it'll be a better quality uh, for vegetables. So make sure you buy a bag that says it, it's okay for, to grow vegetables in it. Um, and you can make your own recipe. Uh, you can you can buy, but it, it's it gets messy if you make your own. You have to make it in big batch. It's very dusty. Uh, you you may have to buy a big bag of a big bag of peat moss or a big bag of uh, choir, and and they're very dusty. They're very dry. You have to wear a mask, and and you would typically mix like you would use your wheelbarrow and mix uh, the peat moss and some compost. Mm. Um, and if you don't have your own compost, I would say buy different kinds of compost, screen them and blend them together and add them to make your, your potting mix. And then you would add some perlite or vermiculite. And the, that, the perlite and vermiculite are very light. They're, they're stable uh, material. They're, um, they, they, they come from their minerals, but they, they've been puffed up at high temperatures. So they don't really degrade and they don't add uh, nutrients to your plants, but they make your soil more fluffy, more aerated and, um, and lighter. When you have potting soil, you, 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 you want your pots to be light and, and you want your soil to drain properly. So that's, that's the purpose of perlite or vermiculite. Some people prefer vermiculite, some people prefer perlite. I just use them interchangeably. Uh, here locally, it's easier to find perlite. And in, in your soil, you may want to add some fertilizer, uh, which would be uh, like a, a dry powdered fertilizer. And again, I make my own and it, in, I have the recipe here of a, a fertilizer you can use. So, Hey, Mano, we're going to jump way deep into fertilizers in like two slides. So can we quickly talk about, I'm going to back this up and just talk about containers for seed starting in your germination environment, because that's really key. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to show us, but if you do, we would love to see it. So you can really plant seeds in all sorts of containers. You can use a plastic yogurt cup with a little hole in the bottom that you make your own. People use egg cartons. People use all sorts of really fun, innovative things. I've seen uh, paper toilet paper rolls get repurposed, eggshells. Like there's ways to do it all on your own that are really fun, that look cute in photos. Some of them work better than others. Um, you can also buy pots. Um, you can buy trays that have little small pots already filled in with them. Um, you can find reuse pots, which I know Mano does a lot. And there's also a technique called soil blocking, um, which is not using any type of plastic or pot. So Mano has a soil blocker that she's holding up. So you would put that piece of metal into soil mix, moist soil mix. It would stick together um, and there's a, a press release that releases out like little small blocks of soil that you plant directly into. Soil blocking can be really beneficial for healthier roots as they're not going to touch plastic and get choked out. Um, it can also, it allows more oxygen into the system, which is nice. You save pots and plastic, which a lot of us like. Um, it is a little bit of a technique. So there is some finesse to get your soil right, to manage everything right, to water it correctly. But a lot of seasoned gardeners really love that method. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be trying it for my first time this season. So we'll see how it goes. The benefits of soil blocks is that they're very small. First of all, you don't have to buy pots, but they're very small. So you can put, if you're using grow lights, 
they take very little space for the same amount of grow lights. And they, um, the roots of the plant grow to the edges of the block and you don't get root bound. If you're using a container, you can't see where the roots are and the roots will circle around the pot once they reach the edges of the pot. Well, with, with a soil block, the, the roots sense that, oh, there, this is air here, there's no more soil, so they don't grow past that. So it, it uh, minimizes the transplant shock. It's, it's easier to transplant. You take your block, you plop it in the hole instead of having to you know, take it out of, the, of its container and damaging the roots in the process. So that's mm -hmm. the benefit of soil blocks. Yeah. And then just quickly on the germination environment, um, seeds need a little bit of warmth. Cool season crops need less, like 50 to 70 degrees is okay for cool season crops. When you start to germinate things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, you need that soil to be above 70 degrees. Ideally, there are tons of ways to do this. You can buy fancy heat mats that are electric and just sit right under your trays. You can get creative and create your own little warming environments. I've seen people use like coolers and hot water heaters or electric blankets. Um, just be careful with whatever you use, like be cautious of flammable materials. Um, there's also all sorts of lighting that you can buy. There's like really fancy LED strip lightings that you can put up. You can do fluorescent lightings. You can do grow lightings. If you are lucky enough that you have a very sunny window, you can also get away with doing that. Um, a lot of people try to do starts at home and they get really long and leggy and flop over. And that's a combination of not having enough light, but also not having airflow. Um, plants build strength when there's slight wind. Um, so I've seen some people set up little fans or if you can put it in a drafty spot of your house. But when the environment for growth is perfect, you actually usually grow weaker plants. So you wanna give them a little bit of stress. So a light fan, um, some people like wave their hand over them every day to just kind of mess with them a little bit. Like the plants need that. Um, so Mino, do you wanna add anything to the germination environment? Yeah, about the, the grow lights, when I start my my blocks, <clears throat> I put uh, either a dome or a piece of plastic on top so it stays humid for a few days. After that, you remove that so it doesn't go moldy. Um, and and once, once your seedlings appear, then they need light. <coughs> and I, I personally like the, the T5 uh, fluorescent lights. You can use the, the, the big the old big uh, fluorescent light, they're usually four, four foot strips. I buy the two foot strips of uh, T5s, which are about the size of my finger. And they, they take less energy, they take less electricity, and um, they fit on my two foot shelves in, in a tight space. And, and you keep your, your grow lights, you keep them two to four inches from the top of your greens to, to, to be efficient. And, and my T5s, they're not grow lights. They're just natural light. Right. You, and to get a grow light, you pay a lot more money to get 20% better benefit, but you get 80% of the benefit with a regular fluorescent. All right. I know we had a question come in about soil and we have a whole um, section about soil. So we're going to address that question when we get to that section. We did want to talk about plant starts quickly because a lot of people, um, like I start a lot from seed. I still buy plant starts every year because I just can't resist. Um, so we wanted to talk about those as we know a lot of gardeners won't start seeds from by themselves or maybe they try and don't have successes. So they want to um, include some plant starts that they have available. So there's tons of different places to buy plant starts. All of our local nurseries and garden centers will have plant starts. Vegetable plant starts are a little trickier. Um, I think Web Landscape and Sun Valley Garden Center have pretty good offerings. Once June comes, you're not gonna be able to find a lot before then. So if you have a greenhouse or a small area where you can plant earlier, the likelihood of finding plant starts in April is probably tough in this area. Um, that's just because it's still cold outside and there's still snow on the ground, right? 
We do have some local farmers that offer plant sales. Um, I don't think any of them are live just quite yet, but they usually start in March and then the farmers will grow your plants out for you and bring them to you, or you can pick them up from them, them at the farmer's market, depending on the farm, um, like May to June. We also do, the Wood River Grange hosts a plant and seed exchange every year. We'll do two again this year, April 24th and May 20. 29. 29th, thank you, Mano. So that's a free plant exchange. Like you can see in this photo right here, these are all the amazing plants that Mano brought last year. Um, she does take donations, that all goes to the Hunger Coalition. Yeah. Um, and then some people have plants for free and there's swaps and exchanges happening and our farmers do attend those events and sell starts at those events. You can also order plant starts from Craze Market and Garden for home delivery as your standard. If, if you order from them, they also sell nice plant starts. Um, so be on the lookout for those at farmers market. So as well, a couple of things that I just wanted to bring up about plant starts right now is kind of thinking about how do you select plant starts. I know for me, when I started gardening, I'd go to the gardening center and I'd buy like the biggest, tallest plant start you could find. And my husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I got the biggest, best one. And he's like, why would you want that one? I'm like, cause it's the biggest and the best, of course. And he's like, well, think about it. If that plant has already reached its max in that container, it's gonna struggle when you transplant it versus if you buy a smaller plant that maybe hasn't started flowering yet, you transplant it and then it really thrives in its new home. So just think about those types of things. I'm not saying like, don't buy a tomato start if there's already a flower on it. Just know that it's already in flowering stage and you want it to grow bigger and taller. So in vegetative stage is the best time to plant new starts and transplants. Um, also just be aware, like you might get a lot of plant starts on sale, like a dollar a piece. But if they're covered in bugs or yellow spots or blight, you might potentially be bringing pests into your garden. So cheap plants are nice, not, not nice enough to um, override the risk of prepping for transplanting are to really harden things off. So when you buy plants from a farm or a garden center, they're most likely going to be put in some type of nursery, greenhouse, safe place where they're protected from wind, rain, hail, bugs to a certain extent. Um, so when you're getting ready to transplant those into your garden, you really want to make sure that they're adapting to your environment. That's usually called hardening off. So we take those plant starts, even if we start them on our own and we slowly get them acclimated to the outdoor atmosphere. So if you have plant starts that you've started or you're buying them, you will take them out for a couple hours at a time in a sunny location, if that's where they're going long-term or in a shady location, if that's where they're going long-term. You wanna get them used to that spot in the garden before you just drop them in there. Um, so give them a couple days, up to a week usually is sufficient. Um, and then once they get stabilized outside with that full sun, that temperature swing from morning to night, like you might start the first three days and only have them out for four hours um, in the morning time. And then you might leave them out longer. And then you might leave them out overnight, a couple nights just to make sure they're doing okay before you transplant them. Um, you also like, once you transplant them, you might wanna protect them from harsh winds, from animals. I know rabbits love little tiny sprouts in the garden. So you can protect them, you can cover them, you can put like plastic bottles over them. I know a lot of people like cut off the bottom of a milk jug to create almost like a little greenhouse that you can just put right over plant starts. And that will definitely help um, keep them safe from wind, from hail. I know like two years ago, we had horrible hail that just decimated half of my stuff. And you can you can protect about that if you plan for it in the future. Um, also it another also, thing on the- It also go ahead. from uh, little critters that want to eat your tender seedlings. They're very hungry in the springtime. Right, and exactly. Birds, squirrels, rabbits, you know, they'll come, or even deer will come in, in your garden and eat your seedlings or the cat will come and use your nice loose dirt as, as a litter box. So ha having a protection for each little baby plant that you transplant is a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And then one really big consideration, I've made this mistake plenty of times is like, 
you're transplanting small plants. They will grow. Do not plant them so close that they don't have room to grow. I think a lot of us in our mind want a completely full garden. It will get to that once it grows. But if you try to plant everything really tight in, you're going to have a lot of failure, unfortunately. So just be in mind, um, be mindful of giving your transplants a lot of space so that they have room to go, their roots have room to grow. Um, Because plants can be expensive. So we don't want you to waste your money by having unsuccessful transplants. Um, you might see on the bottom of this, like the link in green to a local planting calendar and schedule. Mano and Linnea Petty from the Hunger Coalition have been really generous to put those together for us. Um, we'll drop them into the link in the Q&A part because we don't want you to get distracted by looking at those great resources. Um, they're also on our website. So you'll see a link to that on our website if you go there. And we can include all those resources in our follow-up email to this. Go ahead, Mano. Okay. We are going to jump in now to gardening tools. Um, there are a ton of gardening tools. It can be really overwhelming for the first time gardener to be like, well, what do I need? What do I use? When do I use what thing? Where do I find things, right? Um, so there are some like really simple things that every gardener needs. And then there's some things that are just like really fun and nice to have. So we wanted to kind of give you an idea of the different types of tools that you might find yourself using and then really kind of talk through like, what do you need to have a successful garden? And I could say like, the only thing you really need for a successful garden is some type of watering apparatus. Like you can dig with your hands. Um, you, can, you can struggle through it. Um, you can't really garden if you don't have some type of water. Right, so that watering tool is obviously a big one, but obviously shovels are really helpful. Um, carts and containers are also really helpful. I don't think we're gonna go through each one of these just because we don't have a ton of time. Um, Mano, do you wanna maybe share like your top three favorite garden tools and what you use them for? I, I like, I'm a small person and I'm not that strong. So I like tools that are light and uh, very efficient and very easy to handle. And so I, I'd like to show you, I'll step back here. I don't know if you can see this. I have this, this is my favorite tool. It's a little shovel. It, it's a, probably half the size of a big shovel. You know, my husband has a big shovel that probably weighs 15 pounds. I'm exaggerating, but this one is very light. It has a very long handle. So it's easy for me to use it. And it and this wood is very light. And I don't know what this metal is, but because it's smaller, it's it's lighter and it's small. And I can get into small spaces with that. And I got I got this locally in a nursery. Um, this one is more for trees. So this one is an extendable um, telescopic pruner. So I can prune my trees with that. So I have a few fruit trees and especially the Fiskar brand. Fiskar brand is, is, they make tools that are light and uh, very, very sharp, very efficient. Hey Mano, when you're, when you're finished, showing those, will you type the name of the brand of tools you buy into the chat so we can see it? Okay. okay. Thank you. And um, I also have this kind of pruner, which is, again, it's an extended pruner. It's not telescopic, but and it only does small branches, but it, it picks, when I cut something with it, it clicks and it, it keeps it like a, a tongue hmm. so it cuts and it keeps like a tongue it's very handy for any um like ro roses or or hmm. raspberries anything prickly you don't want to get close to or if you have a hard time bending this is really really useful and they come in different lengths so i really love this tool i also <laughs> love this is a uh, French fry basket I got in the kitchen store. I use that to 
strain my compost, strain my soil, strain mm -hmm. stones out of the, of the soil. I use this mm -hmm. all the time. And when mm -hmm. I make my, uh, when I sift uh, my potting soil to make a seal, um, seed starting soil, you want a very fine soil for small seeds. So I sift them using this. Or you can have a, you know, a bigger sifter. I also have a bigger one, but oftentimes I just need a small quantity. So I use this. This is another one, kitchen appliance. It's a flour sifter. I use this also to sift small amounts, especially if I make, if I make my base fertilizer, I buy these uh, ingredients like the rock phosphate and the green sand and the trace minerals and uh, and they sometimes they have big pieces of stones in there so I sift them in here to make my uh, base fertilizer. I already talked about the soil soil block. This this is a two by two. These make two by two blocks and that's the size that. I use the most, but I also made one. I make tools. I love making tools. I make this one, which is a, a size up from the two by two. And uh, I just made it with a piece of branch and an old container and a little creativity. I also harvest a lot of sticks from my trees to use as, you know, to hold my plants. So straight sticks or also I bend them. I would bend the stick once they're still green and I make my own hoops with uh, suckers at the base of my trees. And the last one I want to show, <coughs> this one is for picking fruits from trees. And I found this uh, uh, on YouTube, do it yourself fruit picker. And it's just an old you know, handle that was broken and you use a container, a juice, con plastic juice container. You make a hole in it, in it and you put it on the stem. There are a lot of tools you can make yourself. If you Google, do it yourself, this, there are so many things you can do yourself. So these are my, my favorite tools. Also as a trowel, uh, Am I saying that my French is not helping me here? A trowel? Is that what? Yeah, I'm a trowel. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you can use a regular one, but I have one which call, it's called a hori hori knife. And it's the same size, but it has on one side, it, it has, uh, it, it ha it's serrated. And on the other side, it's almost like a knife and it's, it's sharp. <clears throat> and you can you can sharpen it so it's used as a trowel and also as a harvest tool so i i love that tool we did have a question come in about um the soil blocking tool johnny seeds is the source i know of that you can order online all different sizes um, they did sell out last year. So if you're interested in ordering soil blocking um, tools, you might want to look into it soon. Um, Johnny's Select Seeds is the company I know of. Mano, do you know anyone else who sells them? I bought mine from Peaceful Valley, I think, or, or uh, groworganic.org, or is it .com? But if you just go Google soil blocking, tool, it'll, it'll tell you where they're sold. Being mindful of time, I think we're going to move on to the next slide, but we can definitely, if people have questions about specific tools um, or specific actions that they're looking for the right tool, drop it in the chat and we will hopefully get to it. If not on this webinar, we can follow up via email. Um, so the next sections that we're going to talk about are soil amendments. Um, so soil is a huge conversation on its own, and we invite you to join our soil care webinar happening in May with the Haley Public Library. Um, so I'm going to go through this as relatively quickly and high level as I can. Um, soil health in general, like all plants need nutrients to grow, 
those nutrients can be in soil, people can also add them to the soil to have flourishing plants. Um, a lot of people think like, oh, all plants need is N, P, and K, right? Nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. But plants also need all sorts of other micronutrients, just like we as humans need more than just fat, carbs, and protein to live. We need copper, we need selenium, we need zinc. Plants are the same. So when we give synthetic fertilizers, we're also usually missing all those micronutrients that they need. So Mino and I have the same gardening philosophy of really using organic practices and organic materials. So we build soil health by adding organic matter to our soil. Um, Mino does that primarily through composting. I do composting. I also do a lot of cover cropping and green mulching to build that. So on the top here, you can see these are like the very general rules of um, regenerative agriculture and they can be applied to your gardens. So there's five rules there. Um, I'll go through those very quickly. Living roots in the ground as long as possible. So when you clean up your yard in the fall and take everything off and leave all your soil bare, that is harming your soil fertility. Um, it's harming the bugs that live in the soil. It's allowing runoff to occur. Um, we definitely recommend leaving those roots in the ground as long as you can. Also arming the soil surface, whether that's lots of plants staying there year round or mulching, right? Um, zero scaping would be more of a mulching style than having plants everywhere. Um, you also wanna minimize that disturbance, whether it's tillage or chemical use and maximize diversity. So really incorporating more than just a single vegetable or single flower that you like. And then embracing animal integration is another key tenet of regenerative practices. In gardening, that's a little different than farming, um, but you can do that with a worm bin. You can do that by building the biome of your soil itself is you know animal integration, bugs or animals to a certain extent. Um, you can also have home chickens, you can bring in manure and compost from dairy manure to uh, rabbit manure is a really nice cool manure that can be applied. So bringing in those animal products really helps to build soil fertility. Um, on this page itself, there's this carbon nitrogen ratio that's going really deep into compost, which unfortunately we don't have the time to talk about today. But these are just some of the ideas that you could look at as soil amendments. You can add a lot to soil. Um, some of it's better than others. We like to use a lot of um, plant residues, wood chips, straw and hay, but you also need like that nitrogen from the chicken poop or the kitchen scraps or the fresh leaves that aren't dried yet. So that's important to think about both the carbon and nitrogen, the brown and greens as your compost amendments. But if you don't have a home composter and you need fertilization, there are tons of ways to do that organically. So you can see this is a long list here of all sorts of nutrients that you can buy at a garden store and add into your yard. Um, it can be manures, it can be bone, bone and blood meal, worm casting, that's one of my favorite. I also like fish emulsion. Um, this is to give like a quick punch of fertilizer to the plants while they're growing. This is not necessarily building long-term soil, soil fertility. So that's just things to consider. Um, a lot of gardeners think about doing both, right? Like I want healthy plants and good yields this season. And I also want to build fertility. That's where composting really helps because you're helping the plants now and you're also building soil health long-term. And someone, um, has asked, someone is asking, uh, what's our perspective on bulk soil from local landscape companies? If you need to buy soil, uh, yes, please buy it locally. And if you, once you buy soil, buy soil to start your garden, then you keep it forever. Some people think, oh, they have to buy new soil every year. No, no, don't do that. The soil you buy from from a, a company is, you know, it's it's it will be good gardening soil, but you need to build it, and it'll get better and better and better every year if you do the care that Amy is talking about. If you add more compost every year, if you add manure, if you add your own compost or other kinds of compost, if you do the the, um, the cover cropping. So if, if you mulch your soil from year to year, you will have more and a richer and richer microbiome in your soil. And that's 
that's very important. You also have to build the structure of your soil. So if you have a, a, a clayish soil and it's not draining properly, you have to add something that will help the soil to drain. And, um, but to retain the moisture, it's so dry here. You have to make sure that you, you add something to your soil to retain the moisture. And the more organic matter, the more compost you can add to your uh, soil, the better uh, water retention you will have and the more microbes you will have. When you make your own compost, you're culture, culturing this soil microbiome in your compost bin. If you buy a compost bag from the store, they partially dehydrate that compost. So once it gets to, when it gets to you, it doesn't have the, as rich a microbiome as your home compost. That's why I think that home compost is so much better. It's already adapted. The biome is adapted to our climate, to our bugs here. When you buy a bag of compost, it doesn't have any bugs in it. My compost bin has a lot of bugs in it. And the bugs create the richness of your compost. Yeah, thank you for that visual. I love thinking about compost. I know we're really close to running out of time and I wanna make sure we have mm -hmm. Q&A. I know I can stay here after one o'clock to answer more Q&A. I hope Mano can too. Um, so know that we will stay after one, but we want to get through this so that you all can um, at least receive the information promised to you before Q&A. Um, so just a couple, this is really talking about soil testing and microbiome like Mano just went into. I'm going to skip this for now um, and just talk about record keeping and get into Q&A. But if you want to learn more about soil testing and the soil microbiome, do reach out to us. We hosted a whole webinar about it last year and can share that recording with you. And we can also talk about it one-on-one -on -one with your unique um, situation and put you in contact with our extension agent or uh, soil labs that can help you with testing. Um, the last part about setting up for success is really about record keeping. Um, we talk about this a lot because it's really helpful to be reminded that record keeping is an important part of gardening. It's not maybe the most fun part, um, but it's really valuable, especially when you start to get years and years under your belt. You want to reflect back on like what you planted, where, when, what were those fruit tree varieties you planted on the back end of your yard five years ago? Like you think you're going to remember, most likely you won't. Um, record keeping can be really, really simple. It can be in like a planner that you already utilize. You can get a specific journal. Um, there's also tons of like things that you can Google search of garden planning templates and print out your own, like this example on the right-hand side here, like that's printable off of Google. And then you just make your own little binder. Um, I know some people keep like a journal where they're writing a couple words every day. And then some people have very, very specific, well-organized, detailed lists of everything they've done in their garden every season for decades and decades. And I, How I, you record keep is up to you. I personally use just a, a little journal, you know, and it, it's smaller than eight and a half by 11. Actually, this one is, is not the one I use, but it could be this size or a little smaller. I, I use just blank pages and I can draw you know, I can draw my garden in it and where I put what. And um, I just, I, and I, I've used the same journal for many years now. And so I don't record that much in it. But every time I seed something, I record when I seeded it and what I seeded and which seed, you know, which year the seed was or the source of my seed. And, and then I note when the seeds, when the seedling, when the seedlings show up and then and then while they're growing i don't necessarily write much except if if i want to uh, add uh, fertilizer a like fish fertilizer a liquid fertilizer or or a compost tea i may want to add that every month so i will write in it when i add it and then i will write something in in, in the journal when i uh, transplant or you know, what's the soil temperature at this date this year? And when, when I harvest, I'll, uh, I may make some notes on, you know, the quantities or what, how I use it and how much I have to freeze or, you know, what, how I preserve that and, um, you know, whether I did fermentation and how many jars of fermentation and what went in my recipe. 
So it's it's sporadic. It doesn't have to be every day. It can be very simple and just once in a while you write some notes, the most important notes, things that you think you can't remember. Uh, um, some people remember everything fine, great. Some people like a lot of detail. So you, you can use a, a, a pre-printed journal to do that, but you, it can be very simple. I often think simpler is better to stick with it, but other people feel differently, right? Other people want that structure so that they're held accountable to that every day. Um, okay, we, I think now is the time that we're happy to start taking Q&A in the chat or you can um, unmute yourself, turn your camera on and speak out loud. Um, how do you determine the temperature of your soil? Soil thermometers. A, yeah, so I have a soil thermometer. It's, it's about a foot long, I think. And it's something you buy at a, a, you know, a specialized gardening store. <clears throat> it's available here at our gardening store, or, or, or you can buy it online. Yeah, much better to test soil temp than just air temp. Um, and, and you test the soil temperature at the level where the root will be. <clears throat> mm. So I put up on the slide now that we're coming to an end, um, just some other things like go to our website, 5beresiliencegarden.org to see these resources, to sign up for future webinars, to register your garden, etc. cetera. Um, for those of you able to stay on past one, we'll just keep answering questions as long as we have them. Um, okay, so our first question is gonna be, what cover crops do, I, do we use and planting times? Great question. Um, I use a handful of different types of cover crops. I have my, my primary ones that I use would be buckwheat and radishes. Um, my buckwheat is on its fourth generation. It just comes up on its own. I use it to smother out the weeds and beds, like mostly my three sisters beds. So I have a planting of corn, beans, and squash. That bed also has buckwheat in it. That buckwheat smothers out the weeds while those germinating plants are getting healthy and established. Um, there's tons of different cover crops out there. All cover crops serve different purposes. So if your purpose is to like reduce compaction because you have really compacted clay soil, you want something that breaks up that compaction. So that's gonna be something that has a root on it. So a radish, a turnip, those are pretty um, common cover crop things. If you want to fix nitrogen, which is a way to add fertility to your soil um, without applying synthetic nitrogen, you would want to plant some type of legume. Um, that could be like a broad bean, a cow pea, uh, an Austrian winter pea. It could also be a clover, an alfalfa, a sink foil. Um, there's like, I'm, I'm sure you're getting, there's a lot of different cover crops that serve different purposes. Um, greencoverseed.com is a really great website and I'll include it in a follow-up email um, to learn about different cover crops and what they what benefits they provide. And they're also a really good seed resource. Um, planting times really depends on what cover crop you're planting. Over winter is a really nice time to cover crop. Like if you planted stuff in, an, in August in a garden bed and let it grow a little bit, then it gets snowed on or frozen. Um, and then it kind of re-sprouts in the spring and then you can chop it down and let it sit on your soil. You can till it up, you can till it in. Um, you can solarize it to kill it, or you can plant right into it. That's a really common use and a good way to protect your soil over the winter. Um, you can also use cover crops like buckwheat is a warm season crop. It doesn't grow over winter. It kills at, at the first frost every year. So that's more of a summer um, cover crop. So I know that probably didn't exactly answer your question, but maybe gave you a little bit more to think about Sequoia. And if you have like specific questions about your own um, property or what kind of things you're trying to solve for, we could definitely brainstorm those too. Um, okay, a couple questions coming in. You're welcome, Sequoia. Thanks for your question. Um, I'm going to jump to the earwig question first and then get into the good composter. So Manal, do you have any tips on getting rid of earwigs? I don't because I struggle with them too. Um, Birds. I, I have a A vague recollection that you can have a trap, like uh, for slugs, you can have a, a little dish, a, a shallow little container 
and you put beer in it or um, apple cider vin vinegar or something like that, something that will attract the bugs and they go in the dish and they actually drown in, in the dish. So that's a, a mechanical device mm -hmm. that's easy to, to, to make. Yeah, and earwigs really like water. So they're usually hanging out in moisture spots of your garden. So like for me, I get them, I have like a little insect watering dish that has some little marbles and water for the birds and butterflies and bugs to use. Um, and the earwigs are always hanging out under that. So you can think about eliminating their habitats or how do you drown them with excess water. Um, I have earwigs that eat the, my corn. It's like the saddest thing ever. My corn silks come out one day and I'm so excited. And the next day, earwigs have eaten all of them. Um, I haven't figured out a way to remedy that yet, but my thought would be that there's probably a lot of birds that like earwigs. They're probably a really yummy food source. Um, so could we promote birds in certain parts of our garden that might want to eat those? Yeah, I wonder um, if uh, diatomaceous earth, I use that a lot for other kinds of bugs. I'm not sure about earwigs. Diatomaceous earth. It looks like a flower. It's like a flower. Yeah. I, yeah, you could try that. I mean, my concerns with that is it's going to kill. It's d not discriminatory, so it will kill any bug. Um, so yes, it might let you get rid of earwigs, but it might also kill beneficial bugs or like the predator bug to earwigs, which I don't know what that is, but I assume there is one. Um, and I, my, my other issue with diatomaceous earth, like thinking of the environment that earwigs like where it's moist and wet, diatomaceous earth has to be reapplied every time there's rain or water. So it could be something like if you're using diatomaceous earth, you have to apply it over and over again for a couple of weeks to really notice a difference. So definitely try it if you want to. Um, and I'll maybe do some research on my own end and see if I can come up with anything because I struggle with earwigs too. And I, I like a lot of bugs. I don't like earwigs. They really gross me out when I see them. They just give me the heebie-jeebies. So <laughs> hopefully I can um, research that a little and see if we can come up with some when cool solutions. Comes, when it comes to eliminating bugs, I, I go to Google. I ask, you know, I do a search. How can I get manage? How can I manage bugs naturally? You know, and you name the bug you want to. And especially if you go to a .edu source, um, they'll they'll give you an answer that that is acceptable and organic. Yeah. Um, we did have uh, Kathy. Yes, the PowerPoint will be available. I'll send it in a follow up email to everyone who registered for this today. Um, we'll also post it on our website on 5eresiliencegarden.org. We'll post the presentation um, slideshow as well as the recording of it. So our next question is, can you recommend a good composter that isn't too expensive? I'm going to take that from Kathy. And if Kathy's on and wants to clarify, I'm going to assume she means like a compost, um, some type of thing in your own backyard, not a source of compost. Lots of good questions coming. I'll let you talk about compost, Mano. Yeah, the, I I have I have bought uh, some compost bins from I think it was Home Depot way back then, and it was from Israel, and Israel has a climate that's very similar to here, a very dry climate. Some composters are made for uh, wetter climates, so you have to be uh, knowledgeable about that. Um, and, and I, I haven't been able to find the, this composter anymore. Um, I hope it'll come back sometime. But it, it was basically a kind of square, a square cube, but uh, quite big, probably you know, over 30 inches by 30 inches by 36 high. And there are also round ones that are available, I think now. Um, but these have too many air slots in them. And, and the compost dries up too fast. And, and also the bin being smaller, there's not enough mass to retain the moisture. So you have to water it and stir it more, more often. But they're sturdy and they're, they're good. A, a good compost bin will not allow your uh, the little critters to go in. And it will prevent your uh, de dehydration. And it will retain uh, some moisture 
So you, and you, you need a cover so that animals don't get in. You need a good cover that you can open easily and they'll have a door at the bottom. So I don't think there is a bad one, but I would say the bigger, the better. If you have a choice between a small one and a bigger one, use a bigger one, you know, at least like one, one, yard, one square yard is probably uh, a mass that's acceptable. Smaller than that, uh, it needs more care. Some people have gone and bought the, the rotary ones. You know, it's a small barrel. <clears throat> it's not a big quantity. The theory about it is really great, but you have to keep turning it every day. You have to turn it. And at some point it gets really heavy. So everybody that buys that, they use it for a while and then they stop using it. But my I have, you know, I have a little composter in my yard and I'm, I wish I knew exactly the gallon. It's like one of those big black trash cans, right? With a lid on it. It's like the do it best brand, if that's a brand. I think we just bought it at Ace Lumber and Hardware um, and we drilled holes into it. Um, it has a lid on it. It's really easy. The hardest thing about it is transferring it because if it gets really heavy, it's hard to tip out. Um, but I also use like a compost inoculator that helps to speed things up in the springtime. So I let mine sit in that black container over winter. Then in the spring, I will add a little compost accelerator and then I will dump it into like a, a bigger composting area. But it's really nice, it's like right outside my back door all winter long, I'm adding all my food scraps to it. I have like a single straw bale that I layer. You could layer newspaper, things like that. And it's worked really well like literally less than $25, does not have a, a door at the bottom, like Mano mentioned. So it's not as fancy as some of the pre-made composters, but it works. And for me, if it works and it's cheap, that wins. Um, I also have a vermicomposting system, which is for worms. Mano does too. That's a really nice system for someone that maybe a single person or a couple of people that just have some veggie scraps, but not a ton of composting material. Vermicomposting with worms can be a really great year round option for that as well. And if, and if you'd like to make your own, you can use pallets to make a, a bin. <clears throat> so pallets mm -hmm. are usually free. And uh, we built some at the Grange last year. And what we did to make it animal proof, we put hardware cloth we line the side with hardware cloth. Um, and, and we added a sheet of polyethylene to retain the moisture for the sides. And on top, we put a tarp. So somebody asked us if we would do a class dedicated to composting. Um, we would love to know maybe a little bit more about what people would like to see in that. We did host a workshop last summer where we actually built a compost site at the Grange, which was a really good hands-on experiment. Is like that, are, is that what people are looking for? Or do you want a webinar like this to discuss just like what is compost? How do you do it? The basics of it? Or do you want the hands-on experience? I think Manila and I are definitely willing to do both. Um, just want to know from you, like, is a webinar about composting valuable or do you actually want the hands-on experience of making a compost bin? Um, it was really fun to make a pallet composter last year. We enjoyed that a lot. And Thank you, Kelly. She gave both, she thinks both would be great. Um, well, once in a while, I just host uh, a tour of my compost operation, but that's only, you know, my compost operation, but I go into how what material to use and you know how, how the process works from yeah. to sifting to store. And I will share the Hunger Coalition is um, in process of getting an anaerobic composter on site there. So anaerobic means like without oxygen. So it's a heat environment, it's sealed off and it, uh, it composts things in like three days, which is amazing. And um, I'm going to be working with them on kind of creating a volunteer program for people to actually be able to use that compost and support that. And that could be a really fun way to learn about anaerobic composting too. Um, they think they're going to have the machine uh, at the end of March once they're settled into their new building. So I can definitely keep people informed on that. So if you are not currently a 5B registered resilience gardener, please register for that. You'll be added to a newsletter list where we send out info about, like, about this webinar,
future workshops, ways to be in contact. We also have a Facebook group called 5B Resilience Gardens. It's a private group um, and you could join that. And that's another great way to stay kind of connected to the things happening. But I think Mano and I will brainstorm some composting offerings, both webinar form and maybe um, an in-person distance with mask on workshop in the springtime once the snow melts a little bit more. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Okay, we did get a question of, do you ever cover your garden area with clear visqueen prior to planting as a way of warming the soil? Yeah, so that's solarization. Um, I personally don't. I have in the past. Um, I think it's a really nice way of making a warm spot happen. Um, I've more used the black plastic to kind of smother weeds because they can still grow with the, the clear visqueen because that still allows sunlight in. Um, so if you're looking for warming and weed mitigation, you could try black plastic. Um, Mano, do you ever use the clear plastic to warm up your soil at home? Um, I don't do that much. I might, I might do it for a day or two. If, if I have a raised bed and I want to use yeah. it and it's not quite ready, I might try right. that. But uh, mm -hmm. just be aware that you don't want to cook your soil either un unknowingly. I mean, it, some people will cook their soil if they have, they know they have too many bugs. Right. And they kill the bugs. But when you kill the good bugs, you also kill the microbiome. You have to know that. Okay. So you, you have to rebuild your microbiome. After right. That. And like when you get your, soil to a certain temperature you're also killing that microbiome and reducing the nutrient availability um so that ideal soil temp is really like 70 to 80 degrees um and when you do the solarization you can get up to like 150 degrees which will definitely kill bugs it will definitely kill weed seeds but it will kill all the beneficial good things at the same time so you just have to make that calculated decision for you right like do you have maybe the financial needs to add a bunch of compost after you solarize to build fertility? Or do you have the time to go out there and weed a bunch and maybe the solarization doesn't add much benefit because you like weeding and being outside anyways, right? So kind of think through your own, um, your own needs and your own time frame and your resources to make those types of decisions. But a lot of people do it really successfully. A lot of farmers like only use plastic solarization to warm soil like and you'll also, see also know that uh if you have potting soil if you have a raised bed with a loose soil it will warm up much faster than the soil that it's very clayish mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. adding add, adding more microbiome add, adding more compost uh compost that has a lot of bacteria in it the ba bacterial activity creates heat so the more you have, the more compost you have in your soil, the warmer it will get. Okay. Okay. And that healthy soil like also buffers temperatures, which I'm still kind of wrapping my head around how this actually works in reality versus the philosophical idea of it. But when you have that healthier soil, your low temps aren't as low and your high temps aren't as high. You get kind of that happy equilibrium, that medium zone. Um, there's still a lot of testing and research that has to be done on exactly how that works in our climate, but it's a really nice way to think like the healthier your soil gets, the better it's gonna weather any type of extreme, whether it's rain, like tons of rain, whether it's drought, right? Healthy soils buffer that and build that resilience. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. We did get a comment that they would love to learn how to make a bin. So I think we'll do another compost bin making workshop this um, summer sometime. If anyone knows who needs a bin, like a three bin pallet composter. Or we could give a, a tour of the bins we built last year. Yeah, but it was so fun to build bins. Give yeah. people that hands-on <laughs> experience with tools. I really liked it. So we'll see if, if we know someone who needs a bin, we can probably arrange that. If not, we could do just like a fun tour and we, show the bin that we built last year. We still have some pallets at the green, so we could build another bin to store something in it. Sure. And Azure standard, when they do their drop-offs, they're always looking for people to take pallets. So if you're in need of pallets, um, 
reach out to Mano because she manages that drop now, but they're always having talents available that they'll give people for free. Oh, okay. Linda asked, do you have a resource for cold frames and best use? I don't know about a source, like you can buy the materials at Sun Valley Garden Center. Um, I don't know if they have kits though that are ready to go. No, you know, my, you know? husband, my husband's a builder, so he would build it. I meant more like um, cold frame, like design or, yeah, yeah, and yeah. If, are they raised off the ground so they get air underneath or are they on the ground? And just for starting things and for extra, I don't know, green crops when I have other things going on in the little greenhouse. And because my garden is very small. So we're thinking of expanding with gold cold frames. So you can Google, uh, you can Google do it yourself cold frame and you will find a lot oh, of, <laughs> of course, Google. You'll, yeah, you'll, you will find YouTube uh, videos and, and plans and uh, there's a lot yeah. of it. Not yeah, you essentially want some type of flexible tubing to make your arches of the cold frame. And oh, rather you, than a window frame. Oh, that's the okay. No. Yeah, you. The cold I mean, frame. There's, I, like, there's so many ways to do it. My, I guess. my cold frame. I built my cold frame out of wood, out of cedar wood. So mm -hmm. it, it was good wood, and it's uh, and on top I put a polycarbonate sheet on top, which is very light. Mm -hmm. Or you can use a, an old window frame that you can get from the thrift store in Bellevue. Right. Uh, but the, the these windows are heavy. Right. So the nice thing about my polycarbonate top is that I, I can use a, an, a hydraulic arm. I have an hydraulic arm in it that opens it automatically if the temperature goes above above 70 degrees and it closes automatically. If the temperature wow. is below. So they sell they sell a thermostatically controlled hinge. It's not, it's not thermostat. It's just hydraulic. It's just a probably oil or air. I don't know how it works. But how do you tell it to close and open at certain temperatures? Well, there, there's a little screw. There's a, a a spring and a little screw. And if you tighten it, it will open it at a higher temperature. And if you unscrew it. it you know, so it's not electronic at all. It's it's just totally so manual. You do it. And I think it's thirty thirty dollars per arm. There. So do you have a resource for that? Because that sounds perfect for. Um, I, I think I got mine from GrowOrganic.com. Um, but you it, you again you can Google that. You know, uh, well, we'll tr we'll try to pull all these resources together in our follow up email and send as many of the direct links as possible for that. So we'll do some research on Grow Organic and see if we can find the actual product. That would link. be wonderful. Um, so, but you, I think my question also is about: Is there certain things that you have to be careful with with a cold frame because the if if it's a raised cold frame that it only has so much soil in it. Or if it's on, on the ground, then you'd fill it with soil. But again, you're dealing with a with less soil. So do you have to be careful of what you plant, how you nourish it? I mean, or roots are really strong and they will break through ground and they will find soil if there's soil <laughs> underneath there eventually. Um, yeah. Not that you want to necessarily do it, but yeah, you'd wanna consider like, if you're trying to grow a bunch of carrots and you're gonna add soil, you want enough soil that you can get the length of carrot that you want because as soon as it hits harder soil or a rock, it it moves or stops or it splits. So it really is crop dependent on that. Um, right. But six inches of soil is relatively good for most of your leafy greens. Some, some cold frames are only like 12 inches high at one end and 18 inches at the other end. <clears throat> And, but I built mine much bigger so I can, because I grow a lot of things in pots that are this big, like more than one square, uh, one cube feet, cubic feet, one cubic foot, oh my gosh, one cubic <laughs> foot pots uh, are, are bigger. So I, I want to be able to put my whole pot in there. And, and all my, like my tomato starts, for example, in the spring, I put them in my cold frame and they get to be this high before I transplant them. 
So I built a cold frame that could take that depth. So it depends what you, you could have different depths of cold frame. There's uh, a, I wish I remembered the technique, but it was used a lot in France when France fed itself with all of its own market gardeners before the industrial revolution. And they would take all the horse poop from the roads and kind of pile it up and they would outline it with straw and create kind of this little bed and that decomposition was hot. And then they would just put glass over top of it. And that was their cold frame. So straw, <laughs> horse manure, little soil, glass. You can make it work with a lot of different materials. Um, and then you can buy all sorts of materials to make it as pretty and fancy as you want. It really um, kind of thinking through like, what, what are you gonna use it for? What do you wanna grow in it? is really key to figuring out what design and style of materials you want. Living in Indian Creek, it's a little um, temperature variant, <laughs> you know, yeah. so cold frames would really extend the season because we get really cold and windy. Yeah. And stuff, so. yeah, so you want to make sure that it's the slope of, of your top, you want to make sure it's sloping mm -hmm. toward the south. Oh, of course. Okay. And as you put, I put like big jugs of water in that cold frame to buffer the temperature because the, the water will retain the heat. So the, at night, the temperature will stay higher. Great ideas. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your great questions. It's always fun to kind of troubleshoot things and discuss opportunities with people because every garden's different. Every gardener is different. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can solve your problems. Um, and it's fun to brainstorm that with people. So we don't have any other questions that have come in the chat yet. So if anyone has any additional, please add it now or um, come off mute and speak up and ask us questions or throw your ideas in there. We're happy to hear from anyone. And thank you for those who have already asked us questions. It's been a great Q&A session. I just looked at my um, clock and can't believe it's almost 1.30. So I know a lot of people have jumped off. Don't feel like you have to stay if you need to sign off, but we have a few more minutes if anyone has additional questions. No? All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, be on the lookout. Oh, hey, Mike, I forgot to ask you to drop the survey link in the chat before everyone jumped off. Um, maybe you could add it now for the people that are still on and we'll send it in the follow-up. So like I said before, in the follow-up email to everyone who registered, you'll get a link to viewing this recording. We will get slides. You'll get that survey link and we'll put together some other resources from some of the questions that were asked with lift, uh, links to certain products like soil blocking and that cold frame. Um, if we can find that hydraulic arm along with other stuff. So be on the lookout for that probably by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. We love chatting gardening, as you can tell. So always happy to hear from you and we hope you join us at future webinars.